Well, good afternoon and welcome to the CME lecture this afternoon. <laughs> uh, you know, if you haven't signed in, please um, do so. And if you need CME credit, make sure you fill out the evaluation. And even if you don't need CME credit, uh, we would appreciate any feedback. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are ready, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, my name is Jennifer Lee Rodemarker uh, from the Division of Biostatistics. And this afternoon, um, I was talk about statistics and probability in diagnostic medicine. And this lecture is sponsored by the uh, Clinical and Translational Science Institute and the Division of Biostatistics. And I have no financial uh, interest to disclose. And so in clinical practice, um, diagnostic tools such as blood tests, x-rays, or uh, CT scans, et cetera, are often used to help diagnose diseases. And um, if, if a clinician understands how the accuracy of these tools are measured um, and how they can be interpreted, that will help them use these tools more effectively. So that's part of, that is the goal of, of today's lecture, um, to define some of the quantities used um, in measuring accuracy of, of diagnostic tests. And um, these quantities are sensitivity and specificity, uh, positive and negative predictive values. And then I will explain how prevalence can affect some of these statistics and how likelihood ratio can also be used to um, interpret or estimate the positive or negative predictive values from one study to another study with a different prevalence. And um, sensitivity, specificity, and, and predictive values are defined uh, for tests that give you only two possible outcomes, such as you know, positive or, or negative. When you have a test that gives you multiple outcomes and you can rank them so that the highest value can be given to the result that is the most likely to be positive to the most likely to be negative, then you can use um, the receiver operating characteristic plot to estimate or assess the performance of the test. And uh, the ROC plot can also be used to compare performance of different tests. And you can also use that to determine an optimal cut point. Um, so if you have multiple test results, then you might want to determine one particular point that give you the best cut point to determine um, positive and negative um, for that particular disease. And all these concepts will be illustrated by examples. So uh, if you have any questions along the way, um, please stop me and ask questions. Okay. So let's say in a study where you want to assess performance of a particular diagnostic tool, um, the data that you observe can be organized. Um, as shown here in this table, the disease can be organized as two columns with presence and absence. And then the test result can be organized in two rows for positive results and negative. So here I use D positive to denote the total number of patients in that study with positive disease. And D negative is the total number of patients without the disease. And T um, positive is for the total number of patients with positive test results. And uh, T negative is the number of patients with negative results. And N is the sample size here. So with the information you collected, um, patients that have the disease and their test results are positive belong to the true positive group. And here TP denotes the sample size for that group. And then true negative is the group of patients without the disease and the test results are negative. So they belong to the true negative group and TN is the size of this group. And then uh, if the patient has the disease and their test results are negative, then they belong to the false negative, and Fn denotes the size of this group. And then if they do not have the disease and the tests are positive, then they belong to the false positive group, and Fp uh, denotes this, the size of this group. Yeah. So before I go on and define these, um, these measures, there are two different types of accuracy. The first type is the ability of a test to discriminate between positive and negative disease condition. Um, so sensitivity and specificity are the terms that measure um, this type of accuracy. And, and sen uh, sensitivity and specificity 
are inherent to the test itself. Okay? The second type of accuracy is the predictability of the test. And these are defined by the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. And um, in practice, positive and negative predictive values are more meaningful because the patients come in, their disease status is not known. So you want to use these tools to determine their probability of actually having the disease given that they have certain test results. Okay, so in practice, um, positive and negative predictive values are, are more uh, useful for a clinician. So um, the sensitivity is defined as the probability of a person having the disease that have a positive test result. So here we have, you know, we use the table that, uh, that we showed earlier to um, estimate the sensitivity, then it's the ratio of true positive to the disease positive group. Okay, so we're looking at the rate of true positive if you know the patient's disease status. So the higher value of sensitivity, the higher the ability of that test to rule in the disease. Okay. Specificity is the probability of a person without the disease having a negative test result. So using the same table, it can be estimated by the, the ratio of true negative to the disease negative group. Okay. So the higher the value of specificity, the higher the ability of the test to rule out a disease. Because here, given that you know the disease is negative, the, that's the proportion of people that actually have a negative result. So that's the true negative rate. Okay. Any questions before I move on to the next terms? Okay. So sensitivity and specificity are inherent to the test itself. Now, if we want to look at the predictive accuracy of the test, then we need to look at positive and negative predictive values. So positive predictive value is defined as the probability of a person with a positive test result having the disease, okay? So here we're looking at the pro proportion of true positive out of the test positive group. So in this case, the disease, the denominator is the, the test result, not the disease status. So, um, and then the negative predictive value is the probability of a person with a negative test result being disease free. Okay? So it can be estimated as the proportion of true negative uh, out of the test negative group. Okay? So if you contrast um, positive predictive value to sensitivity, you have the same numerator, but the denominator here for positive predictive value is the test positive, whereas in sensitivity, the denominator is the disease positive group. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, here's an example how the, you know those quantities can be uh, computed. So we use an example um, of a liver scan, and we want to see how good this liver scan is at diagnose abnormal uh, liver pathology. So in this example, we have the disease as abnormal pathology. So abnormal is considered um, disease positive, and normal is considered disease negative. Okay, and the test result, abnormal again is positive, and uh, normal is negative. So in this, in this example, we have um, 231 patients in the, 231 uh, patients in the true positive group, and 54 in the true negative group. And we have 27 in the false, negative, and then 32 in the false positive group, okay? So from these number, we can get the sum for each category, and the total sample size is 30, 344 patients, too. Yeah. Well, I should say 344 subjects, because some of them are, have normal, so they're not really patient here, okay? So to calculate sensitivity, um, so we look at the proportion of true positive out of disease positive, so we get 0.9. So this value here means that based on this study, um, this, 
liver scan can correctly identify abnormality 90% of the time, right? So you know that, the, that 258 of these patients have um, abnormal liver and 231 out of them actually have true, uh, true positive results. So it correctly identified 90% um, of the patients here. Okay. For specificity is the ratio of the true negative out of the disease negative group. So 54 over 86, it gives us 63.63. So in, based on this study, the scan can correctly identify normality 63% of the time. Okay. Now we look at the positive predictive values. The numerator is the same as in sensitivity. We're looking at the proportion of true positive, but this time it's true positive out of the test positive group. Okay. So this time we get 88% as the positive predictive value. So what this means is that based on the study, the scan can correctly predict abnormality 88% of the time. Okay. And then for a negative predictive value, we're looking at the ratio of true negative out of the test negative group. So now we get 67%. So what it means is the scan can correctly predict normal pathology 67% of the time. So this is how you can, can calculate these values if you are given a table. Um, but one thing I want to point out is sensitivity and specificity, they are inherent to the test. So if you have that information, then that is always meaningful. For positive and negative predictive values, all those, we can always calculate them, but they don't always have meaning. And I will explain that in, uh, in a little bit here. So before I explain that, I want to um, define disease prevalence, okay? So the disease prevalence is the probability of a person in a population having the disease. And the population here um, is context specific. It depends on the study that, you, that you're doing, right? It depends on, you know, what group of people you want to generalize your study to. So the population can be everybody on earth or it could be all infant in the state of Wisconsin. So it, it is specific to your study. And if the study that have subjects randomly selected from the population of interest, then prevalence can be estimated as the proportion of people with the disease in that study out of the total sample size, okay? And this is only true if the subjects are randomly selected from the population. It's not true for case control because in case and control study, you select the cases separately from the control, right? And then you identify how many controls you want for each case. So if you want one control for every case, then, and if you use this formula to estimate the prevalence will always be 50%, which might not be the true prevalence of the disease for that particular population. Okay, so the point I want to emphasize here is this, this estimate is only applicable if the subjects are randomly selected from the population of interest. Okay, so if we assume that that is, tr that is true in the example we just showed earlier, then the prevalence for abnormal liver here is 75%. Okay, so just the total of disease positive out of the sample size, 75%. But prevalence affects the positive and negative predictive values. And that's why I say to be cautious when you use positive and negative predictive values. Okay. So because prevalence does not affect sensitivity and specificity, and this is, you know, we can see why here. Sensitivity is calculated as the proportion of true positive out of disease positive. So it's computed you know, only out of the disease positive group, okay? Whereas specificity is calculated as the proportion of true negative out of disease negative, and it's only calculated within the disease negative group, okay? So it has not, so it's not calculated across the groups of disease positive and negative, so prevalent doesn't affect sensitivity and specificity. 
positive and negative predictive values are calculated across the group. So here, positive predictive value, we calculate the proportion of true positive out of the test positive group, right? Because the test positive group includes people with the disease that have positive tests or peop and people without the disease that have positive tests. Okay. And similarly, negative predictive value is the proportion of true negative out of the test negative group. So again, you know, um, the test negative group includes people that have the disease who has negative test result and people who do not have the disease and have negative test result. So that's why prevalence affects these quantities. Okay. So if the disease prevalence is high, it means that you have a higher number of people in the disease positive group, right? So it means in general that true positive and false negative will be higher, okay? So it means that positive predictive value will be higher when the prevalence is high. And the true negative will be smaller, so negative predictive value will be, in general, be smaller when the prevalence is high. Okay. When the disease is rare, it means that you have a lot more people in the disease negative group, right? So it means that you, in general, you have more people in these two groups, false positive and true negative. So it means that your positive predictive value will be lower and your true negative um, will be higher, so your negative predictive value will be, will be um, higher as well. So let's look at an example. Here I have two different populations, um, population A and po population B, and we assume that the subjects in each study are randomly selected from the respective population. Okay, so population A, the subjects um, are selected randomly from population A, and these numbers are the same as the, the example that we saw earlier. Okay, and here we know that we calculated the sensitivity, specificity, prevalence, and positive negative predictive values, right? So we know prevalence is 75% for this group, okay? And let's say 75% prevalence for abnormal liver, that's really high. So let's assume that this population here are, you know, based on some criteria, they're heavy drinkers, so they have a higher rate of abnormal liver, right? If you want to use that same test here, this diagnostic tool that has sensitivity of 90% and specificity of 63% at diagnosing um, abnormal liver, then if you use the same test on a different population, now if we think of population B as the general population, okay, and these samples are randomly selected from po population B, and here, the prevalence of that population is 7.5%. So here, the prevalence is 10 times lower than the prevalence of population A, okay? And then based on that information, we can calculate the positive and negative predictive values. And you look at the difference here. Okay, when prevalence is 10 times lower, positive predictive value from this study goes from 88% down to 16%. So that's a very large a very big change. And then the negative predictive values goes from 67% up to 99%. So when the prevalent is lower, the positive predictive value is lower, but the negative predictive values is higher. This is similar to what I show in the previous slides when you look at the, in general, just look at the proportion of people that have the disease versus people that do not have the disease. When the prevalence change, does that make sense? Okay, so the point here is given the same test, the prevalence of the disease can change the positive and negative predictive values. So when you use positive and negative predictive values, you have to be very cautious, um, especially because it is specific to a prevalence so if you have a positive predictive value or negative predictive value from one study, you cannot automatically assume that it's the same in another study because in another study, the, the population might be different. It might have different prevalence. 
So you can't generalize that to another population or another study. And again, just like in prevalence, um, the estimate is only meaningful if the samples are randomly selected from the population, right? So the same applies here. So positive and negative predictive values are only meaningful when the samples from the study are randomly selected from the population. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so next, um, there's another quantity that could be used to describe accuracy of a test, and it's called likelihood ratio. And it is defined as the ratio of the probability of having a test result given the disease to the probability of having the same result without the disease. Since we're talking about diagnostic tools that give you only two possible um, results, positive or negative, then there are two different likelihood ratio. One is positive likelihood ratio that is associated with positive result, and then the negative likelihood ratio that you give that is associated with negative test result. So here I just want to focus on positive um, likelihood. So we're looking at the ratio of the probability of having a positive, a positive test given the disease. So here we are looking at the true positive given the disease, right? Versus the probability of having the same test result here, we're talking about true po um, positive test results. So in out of the disease negative group, so here we're looking at the ratio of false positive um, out of, of negative uh, disease group here. So the likelihood ratio is the ratio between these two quantities. So if you look at, at these terms, that is the numerator is sen the sensitivity, and the denominator is one minus specificity, okay? So if a test is absolutely useless, then your true positive rate is about the same as your false positive rate, right? So the likelihood ratio would be around one so we use one as the reference for a positive uh, likelihood ratio. If the true positive rate is higher, a lot higher than the false positive rate, then the likelihood, positive likelihood ratio will be a lot higher than one. Okay, so one is used as the reference and the values that are a lot larger than one for positive likelihood ratio is considered good for, um, for a test, okay? So here we can see that the likelihood ratio is calculated out of sensitivity and specificity. Okay, so it's so in the same um, in the same term, you know, it it is specific to the test. The useful thing about likelihood ratio is even though it's specific to the test, you can use this relationship here to adjust the um, the post-test probability. So what it means is you can use this likelihood ratio and use this relationship to estimate the positive predictive value for a different population. Because earlier I say the negative and positive predictive values are only applicable or est you know, um, the estimates are meaningful only if the ran uh, only meaningful <laughs> if the samples are uh, selected from, randomly selected from the population. Right, but if you have a case control study, and you can get the sensitivity and specificity, you can calculate the likelihood ratio, and then you can use this uh, relationship to estimate the positive and, neg and negative predictive values for another population or for a population that you know the prevalence of. Okay, so if we go back to the liver scan example, the likelihood ratio is 2.4, okay? So earlier, we had two examples, population A and population B, right? And we know the prevalence of those two populations, and we had all the information so we could calculate the positive and negative predictive values. Let's say if you want to use the same test on a third population, let's say population C, which you don't have the samples of, or you don't have a study, you know, particularly um, based on this population, 
but you know that this population have the prevalence of abnormal liver at 15%. Okay, so you can use that information along with the likelihood ratio to estimate the positive predictive value for, for that population. So the pretest odds here, so the re relationship is post-test odds equals pretest odds times the likelihood ratio. So the pretest odds come from the prevalence, right? Uh, odds is the ratio of the prevalence um, over one minus prevalence. So here, if we, if we know the prevalence is 15%, then we can calculate the pretest odds as 15% divided by one minus 15%. So the odds for, for this disease is 18%, okay? So what pretest odds mean that is the odds having the disease before you have any test, you know, without any knowledge of what your test result would be, okay? So if we have this information, if we plug that into this equation, we have pretest pre odds of 18%, and we have the likelihood ratio of 2.4, then the post-test post odd is 40.42, okay? So we have the post-test odd, plug into this equation here, then we can find the post-test probability of 30%. This is the positive predictive value, the estimate for the positive predictive value. Okay. So, you know, without even having the sample for this particular population, if you know the sensitivity and specificity of a test and you want to estimate the positive predictive value for that same test on a different population, you can use that relationship to figure out, to estimate the positive predictive value. Okay. And yes? The meaning or how to get, to get. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the odds is the ratio of of the probability of having something to the probability of not having something. Okay, so pretest odds is the probability of have the odds of having the disease before you get tested. No, well, let's say we're talking about the, for the example that we, that we use here, right, for population A, we're looking at heavy drinkers, okay? If you're a heavy drinker, but you have not gone through to get your liver scan, okay, then your, your pretest odds would be the prevalence divided by one minus the prevalence. Because the probability of having the disease is the prevalence, right? So before you even get tested, the prevalence is your probability of having the disease. Does that make sense? Well, usually the prevalence, either if, if you randomly select the subjects in the study, then you can estimate that. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the sample, and based on literature or from previous experience, maybe you can have an estimate of a prevalence for a different population. Mm -hmm. So you can use that prevalence in this case. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the point here. You know, you can, you know, with the information, you can definitely calculate the positive predictive values, right? But without the table, the information table, like, we show here, you know, you can't really calculate the positive and negative predictive values, then you, you can use that relationship, and that's the usefulness of the likelihood ratio in this situation. But, you know, if you, I didn't have, you know, I didn't think we would have time, so I didn't put the information in, but if you use the prevalence here and plug that into the equation, uh, you end up getting the same positive and negative predictive values here, okay? So it's just another way of getting the, the information without having the whole um, sample or the whole study um, samples. Any other questions? 
Okay, so those statistics were defined for um, a test when you get positive or negative results. When you have a test that gives you quantitative results and you can um, organize them so that the, you know, you give the highest score to the most likely to be positive, okay, all the way down to the most likely to be negative, okay, if you can organize them that way, then you can use the receiver operating characteristic plot to look at the overall performance of a test. And then you can also use that to compare different tests. You know, if you have two or three different tests to diagnose the same disease, you know, you can compare different tests, performance of different tests using the ROC plot. And you can also use it to choose an optimal cut point because if you don't want to have five different poss possible results, you can find one particular cut point that give you either abnormal or normal. Okay. So all this can be accomplished by calculating the sensitivity and specificity for each cut point. And um, to illustrate that, I want to use the uh, example from CT scan. So here, you know, again, we're looking at um, liver abnormality again. So disease status abnormal is considered positive. Normal is considered nor um, a negative. Okay. And for this CT scan, there are five different possible results. You can have definitely abnormal, probably abnormal, unsure, probably normal, definitely normal. So we order them so that they go from most likely to be positive to most likely to be negative, right? Okay, and if I give scores to them so that the most likely to be positive in this case, it's definitely abnormal, has a, a score of five, and then the next level has a score of four, three, two, and one, and so on, okay? So if we look at each of these, each of these can be a cut point, right? You can treat five as the cut point, so it means that if you have, you know, definitely abnormal result, then you're considered positive for, for abnormal pathology, okay? Anything else besides that will be considered um, negative, okay? If I choose four, probably abnormal, as the cut point, then anything that is above four will be considered positive, and anything below four will be considered negative, okay? So we can go on and treat each of these as a cut point and calculate the sensitivity and specificity, as shown here. So let's say first, if I treat five as the cut point, then everything that is five will be considered positive. So sensitivity is the proportion of true positive here, so 33 out of 51. So that gives you um, 0.65 as the sensitivity. And then anything that is below five for this cut point will be considered negative. So the n true negative root includes all these observations. Okay, so specificity is 56 out of 58, so that gives you 97%. Okay, and then next, if I want to use four as the cut point, then anything that is four and above will be considered positive. So sensitivity is 44 out of 51, which gives you 86%. Okay, and anything below four is considered negative. So the specificity is 45 out of 58, and that gives you 78%, okay? And then for our next, sensitivity is this, all these um, observations here out of 51, so it gives you 90% and so on. So you can treat each of these cut point as, um, as a you know, cut point for qualitative results and then calculate sensitivity and specificity. And we can only go down to two, right? Because if you use one, then everybody here will be positive, then your sensitivity will be 100%, and your specificity will be zero, because you have no patients left below one, okay? And then with specificity, you can calculate one minus specificity. And the reason we want one minus specificity is for an ROC plot, you plot sensitivity versus one minus specificity, okay? 
So after you calculate all the sensitivity and specificity pairs for each cut point, you can plot them on this plot here. So the vertical axis is sensitivity, and the um, horizontal axis is one minus specificity. Okay, so if a point is higher, um, it means that it has higher sensitivity. Okay, if it is further to the right, it means it has higher one minus specificity, it means that it has lower specificity. Okay, so one way of looking at this is sensitivity is the true positive rate. One minus specificity is the false positive rate. Okay, so any points, so here, if you have a test that is absolutely useless, then your true positive rate and false positive rate will be equal, right? So all the points on your plot should be located along this line here, where sensitivity and specificity, um, or one minus specificity are the same. So true positive and false positive rate are about the same. Then all your points should be um, located along that line. If you have a test that is perfect and discriminating between positive and negative, then all your points will be located along these two lines here, okay? And in, in practice, most plots or most points will be between these two extremes. So we use the example that we just calculated earlier. We have sensitivity and um, one minus specificity. We can plot those points here and you can see that all the points are between the reference line and the, the perfect um, test line. Okay. So you can see that, you know, when you lower the cut point, you gain in sensitivity, but you also gain in false positive rate. Okay. So determining which point is optimal to use um, is a trade-off. You know, because you know, it depends on how much you gain in which direction. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the next couple of slides. Okay. So here, if you look at this plot, you know, um, an ROC curve that is above this line is somewhat useful, right? And you know, the further it is from this line and the closer it is to the upper left corner, then the more accurate um, the tool is or the test is. And so this is a visual assessment of, uh, of a test. You can also calculate the area under the curve to, um, to uh, assess the overall performance of a test. So if you have this curve here, you can look at the area right below that curve. So this area right here, the total area. That would give, also give you um, a quant quantitative number to assess the performance of a test. And the area under the curve, um, the meaning of it is if you randomly pick a person with the disease and a person without the disease, the area under the curve is the probability that a person with the disease will have a more positive test result. Okay? So if a test is useless, of course, you know, the probability of a person with a disease and the person without the disease having um, the person with the disease have higher test result than the person without the disease is 50%, right? If the test is useless, it can't uh, identify between positive and negative condition, okay? So if you look here, as early, earlier, I say this reference line is, you know, if the ROC curve is along this reference line, then the test is useless. So if you look at the area under the curve, okay, under that reference line here, the area under this curve is, is 50%, right, 0.5. So that's what, uh, what it means by, it's a reference, um, the area under the curve for a useless test is 50%. Any questions? Okay. So um, now we can use, you know, if you have two or three different tests, to diagnose the same condition, you can make ROC curves for each of the tests and then uh, visually um, assess their performance. 
So let's say if I have test one uh, with ROC curve here in yellow, and then test two with ROC curve in blue, and visually, you know, you can see that the curve for test one is to the upper left of test two, right? So visually, it looks like test one is a better performer than test two, okay? So here it is obvious because every single point of test one is, is above and to the left of test two. But for this situation here where you have crossover and it's hard to see, you know, to visually see which one is better, um, you can use the area under the curves to compare the performance of the test because you can always ca you can calculate the area under under the curve and then the one with a larger area under the curve will be a better performer. Okay. And I'm not going into details of how to calculate the the areas. Uh, you know, there are software out there that can help you do this, or if you need help, you can uh, come to the consulting center and somebody can help you uh, calculate the area. Okay. And another use for the OOC plot is to pick out the optimal cut point. Like I said earlier, if you, you know, if you lower the cut point, um, then you gain in true positive rate, but you also gain in false positive rate. So to determine an optimal cut point, it's a, it's a lengthy process and it takes a lot of, of considerations and thoughts because you have to take into account the cost of false diagnoses. Okay, and cost here, it means financial cost, moral cost, psychological cost, you know, anything that you can, can think of that affect a patient or, you know, affect the patients or um, the population in terms of um, having di false diagnoses, okay? And another thing to consider is the prevalence of the disease, and these are only two of many things that you should consider when you decide on an optimal cut point. And um, so to use these two, um, just in general, let's say if the prevalence is the same and the effect of cost of false diagnoses, let's say if you, the cost of false positive is high, is higher than false negative, then it means you want um, a cut point that has lower false positive rate, right? So it means you want to choose a cut point that is closer to the, um, the vertical axis here. So maybe this will be the best cut point to use if the cost of false positive is higher than the cost of false negative. Okay, so this is only general consideration, you know, a specific cut point. There are formulas where you can apply um, to different parameters, different things to, to choose the cut point, but this is a, just a general um, uh, direction. If, you ha if the cost of false negative is higher than the cost of false positive, then you want to have a cut point that, that, is, um, that, has higher, that has higher sensitivity, okay? Um, because here, sensitivity here, right? If you look at this, this is the true positive rate. So the higher you go, the, the higher the true positive rate. But there's the other side of the axis over here too, you can think of this as the true, as the false negative um, axis here where the, the, lower, um, the lower the sensitivity or the lower the true positive, the higher the false negative, okay? So if you have a test that, that has um, higher false negative cost, then you want to choose one that has higher sensitivity. So maybe this point will be, um, will be a good cut point for that situation. And then prevalence, again, you know, like I say, when prevalence is, is very low, you need a test with extremely high sensitivity to achieve a reasonable positive predictive values, right? So you might want to choose one that, um, that has higher sensitivity. So maybe that will be a good cut point to use. Yeah. So those are only general guidance, but like I say, many things should be considered when picking out an optimal cut point. Okay. Any questions? Okay, okay so um, in this talk, we define sensitivity and specificity, and these are the two quantities that describe the accuracy of the test um, in terms of identifying 
uh, the disease, and they are inherent to a test. So prevalence does not change sensitivity and specificity of a test. Whereas positive and negative predictive values are affected by prevalence, and they need to be used cautiously. Um, they're only meaningful you know, for a specific population with a spe specific prevalence. Okay, you can't just apply the positive and negative predictive values from one study to another without um, making sure that the prevalence is the same in the other population. Okay. But likelihood ratio is a useful uh, quantity to use um, to estimate the positive predictive values for, um, for a population with a different pre prevalence. And then ROC curves, um, they are very useful in comparing different tasks to determine optimal uh, cut points. And also, when you have multiple results, you can uh, look at the ROC curves and you know, assess the overall, overall performance of the test. Um, then the ROC curve, this is, um, this is not the only situation that you can use the ROC curves. Um, you, know, you will see the ROC curves again um, and th they are applicable in many different situations. I think you'll see ROC curves again um, in the context of logistic regressions in one of the future lectures. Okay. And uh, well, these are the websites for resources. Uh, I don't know why the, the link to the website is kind of uh, moved up there. But if you need more information, you can go to the CTSI or biostatistics website. Um, we do have the consulting center. And so if you have a project and you need help with your, um, your uh, project, then you can stop by the um, consulting uh, service at these different locations. So any questions? Thank you.